Have you heard about these new Intel chips? Now I haven't had Intel on my main PC since 2018, but Raptor Lake is so cool that I chose it for my test bench. You may have seen this test bench in a previous video. It's powered by an i5-13400F in a Sonic-themed motherboard, 32 gigs of DDR5 RAM, and right now my beloved Hellhound. Nothing fancy, but it's no slouch either. Intel's 13 series are absolute beasts. The highest end ones can clock up to 6 gigahertz and absolutely overwhelm anything other than the best coolers you can buy. My i5 on the other hand is just fine with a cheap and cheerful VTrue V5, only hitting 40 or 50 degrees in game. But that sounds expensive. What if you don't want to pay for a new platform, DDR5 RAM and Sonic the Hedgehog? Did you know you can get a high-end CPU on eBay for about 40 bucks? 200 if you want a motherboard and RAM combo too. I happen to have one such CPU in this case here. So which is a better buy? A brand new platform with cutting edge tech? Or more likely, how much faster is a mid to low end CPU from 2023 compared to a very fast CPU from 2014? Now this is funny. The X99 platform launched right at the start of M.2 compatibility, so the way you mount one to this board is to stick it straight out of the motherboard, and this giant weird CPU cooler is so large that you can't fit a 2280 M.2 drive, hence why I'm using a tiny little 2230 one. The architectural differences are quite significant. The i5 has 6 P cores and 4 E cores, standing for performance and efficiency respectively. Only the P cores get hyperthreading, so in total we have 16 threads. Whereas the i7 has 6 cores, but all of them have hyperthreading, so we get 12 threads in total. Windows 10 does not like the mix of P and E cores on the 12th and 13th gen, so I'll be testing that on Windows 11. The i7 is too old to officially support Windows 11, so I'm testing that on Windows 10. Performance would probably suffer if I put it on 11 anyway, so we're giving it the best shot it has. Cinebench is a standard test at this point, but it's not looking good for the i7, with the i5 doubling its score in both the multi-core and single-core tests. In fact, the i5 also beats my 5900X edit PC in single-core. Man, no wonder Intel has the killer gaming reputation. Speaking of gaming, let's get into that, since that's what most people actually do with high-end PCs. Now I'm going to be using my Hellhound, because taking the 3080 or 4080 out of my other PCs is a huge pain in the ass. And I bet we're going to be able to CPU limit the i7 with a 6600 XT anyway. Using the i7 on a fan-made CSGO benchmark map, we can see we're severely CPU limited, down to under 200 FPS in some spots with an average of 326. Not that that's unplayable, but when the GPU is allowed to go ham with the 13400F, we can get an average frame rate of 506, even touching 600 and 700 in some shots. For all of you out there with demonic 666Hz monitors. Spider-Man is a much newer and more demanding game. As you can see, even at 720p with the lower settings, we're not CPU limited on the i5 at all. I'd need a much stronger GPU to push past its limits here. The i7 is sadly limited again, though it is using all its threads. This is by no means a bad experience, but it's not a patch on the newer i5. Handbrake is a tool I use constantly, both for backing up my movie collection and for video production. Ever try to drag a TS file into Resolve? Anyway, it's very heavy on the CPU, so it's a good benchmark. I'll transcode a chapter of the bad guys into the demanding AV1 codec and see how long it takes. And why am I using the bad guys? Oh, you know, no reason in particular. This matches the Cinebench score differential almost perfectly, with the i5 taking just over half the time the i7 did. AV1 is tough, so this is extremely impressive. I think it's safe to say the new i5 is approximately double the performance of the old i7. While we wait for those to finish encoding, we can check power use. The i7 uses 71 watts at idle and 200 watts under load, whereas the i5 almost halves that with 40 watts at idle and 140 at 100% load. The lower idle use might be due to the E cores taking over background processors. Remember, this is full system power and I've tried to keep the two systems as broadly similar as I can. I think it's astonishing that a CPU this cheap 
has 10 cores and performs this well. But what about the old one? I mean, there are certainly advantages. The new i5 only has 20 PCI lanes, although they are PCI4, whereas the old i7 has 28 PCI3 lanes. Same with SATA. Most x99 boards have crazy amounts of SATA ports. Mine has 14. So if you wanted to make this into an absolutely killer file server, all you'd need is a 10 gig network card and 14 hard drives. Most x99 motherboards are pretty expensive, and I don't know if they all share that stupid M.2 connector, but what they do all share is high power use, and that really pushes me towards suggesting a new platform, or a newer platform than x99, rather than getting a cheap one off eBay. It would also be outdone by the Ryzen 5600 that I put in my Xbox PC a few weeks ago. So if you want six cores for much lower power use, I would say go for a 5600 on an AM4 motherboard over one of these. You can get six cores with much lower power use, double the single core performance, and a clear upgrade path with a Ryzen 5600 since a good AM4 motherboard will let you up that to a 5950X and use it for more than just games if you wanted to. But I tell you what's faster than a 5600, this 13400F. This thing absolutely rips. It is well worthy of the Sonic the Hedgehog motherboard. Honestly, if anything, this makes me more excited to see what AMD is going to do for the next generation to counter how fast these low-end chips are. Hopefully I'll be there to cover it when it happens. I'll see you next time.